So we need to talk about a distillation setup. Now the distillation you might not have done yet. And if so, this is my time to kind of explain what the distillation setup is gonna look like. If you have done distillation, then you could probably skip these first couple of minutes of this video because that's all that we're gonna be talking about. So whether it's you or whether it's Mr. Cotton up in the woods, your distillation is gonna be the same thing. So we need to talk about pieces and parts. So first off, in your distillation that you're going to be doing in the lab, you need some type of container. And this container is going to be a bowling flask for us, a round bottom bowling flask. And in this bowling flask, you're going to have your liquid from the mash. Now, I'll talk about the precursor of the lab in just a second, but this is just the distillation setup, okay? So the liquid from the mash is going to be poured into this round bottom flask. Cotton would have used the same thing. It could have been a barrel, though, instead of a round bottom piece of glassware. And that mash liquid is going to have to be heated up. So we're going to put a flame on it down here at the very bottom. And that flame is going to cause some vapor to rise up the flask. Okay? Well, on this round bottom flask, we want to give the vapor enough time to kind of separate. Right? We want to get as much water as we can and other contamination out of the way. And if we give it a little more room in order to separate, then that's typically a better product that we'll get in the very end. So very often you might see some type of extension that will go here on the distillation. Sometimes you'll use it, sometimes you won't. It just depends on what type of distillation that you're trying to do. So that extension allows the components to separate a little bit better, okay? Up here at the top, there's gonna be an elbow. And this elbow is basically going to curve around. Sometimes they'll call this a gooseneck. You can kind of see why they call it a gooseneck. There's the eyeball, and there's the beak, and there's the goose head, right? So that gooseneck adapter is going to turn the corner and allow your vapor to go into a condenser. And there's going to be two knobs on the condenser. One is for a water in and one is for a water out. The water in always goes at the bottom of the condenser. And this pushes the water up through the condenser and out the top. So water in at the bottom every single time you set a condenser up. And then finally, over here to the side, we'll probably need some other type of adapter. Sometimes it's just called a drip adapter. And you'll need some type of collection flask down here below it. So the drip, 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 drip goes into your collector. Okay, so that's the distillation setup as a nutshell. You've got to have a bowling flask, or in Cotton's case, a barrel. You have to have some way to separate these components from each other. And we use basically an extension and a gooseneck in order to do that. Well, in, cop in Cotton's case, he's probably using copper tubing that's coiled up. So the vapors can go up the coil and out the other end. There's also a condenser that you're going to have to have that has cold water. Well, Cotton would have to have this as well up in these woods which is why most distilleries and most moonshiners like to be close to a source of water, like a stream or some type of creek. And then finally over here, we need some type of other collection flask, which in Cotton's case would be something like a moonshine jug, maybe, that they would collect the alcohol in. Okay, there's your distillation setup, and that's exactly what you will be doing in the lab when you get to that point. However, the distillations can look very different than this, depending on the type of distillation that you're doing. There's steam distillation, there's simple pot distillation, there's fractionation distillation. There's so many different versions. This is just the most general. Okay, so let's talk about maybe the precursor. 
You said this liquid mash has to be here inside of this container, right? Well, what is the liquid mash? Well, here's a little bit of chemistry that begins to happen here. You are going to be required to take yeast. This is basically yeast that you can get at the grocery store. There's nothing special about this yeast at all. And you're going to add sugar to it. And the yeast and the sugar love each other. Yum, 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 yum. Yeast will go crazy and then will eat the sugar up and they will get so fat and they will get so bloated that they begin to poop and pee. Well, what do they poop and pee? Well, they'll eat so much that first they will burp and they will burp out CO2, carbon dioxide. So when the fermentation process begins to happen for you, you will see bubbles getting generated in your receiving flask or in a uh, some type of container. And that bubble is a very good sign. Bubbles mean that the yeast are eating and the yeast are alive and they're doing well. And they are just belching CO2 out of their mouth. And as long as you've got an environment that can kept, capture that gas and show you bubbles then you know when the fermentation process is done. Because when the bubbles stop, there's no more fermenting that's happening. Okay? So CO2, these are bubbles. And when there are no more bubbles, then that means the fermentation ends. No more. All right, well, what else does it make? Well, as the yeast eats the sugar, not only does it burp, but it also pees. What does it pee? Well, it pees out ethanol. CH2, or 3, CH2OH. And that ethanol you're drinking, that alcohol is used to make every other alcohol that you find in an ABC store. Not just moonshine. This is the way this process works for every single vodka, gin, tequila, bourbon, whiskey, anything that you like to drink. This is the process of how it's made. So you are drinking yeast pee. Keep that in mind the next time you go get an alcohol bottle at the ABC store. Appetizing, isn't it? All right, well, that alcohol is CH3CH2OH. I'm going to draw that structure a little bit. Here's C, C, and then it's connected to an OH group. Off of each one of these carbons are hydrogens, CH3, so three of them on the first one, CH2, two of them on the second, and then OH here at the very end. This OH, this is basically called your alcohol functional group. And you've seen that over and over in other pre-lab discussions as well, if you've done some of these. So that is an alcohol, and we call this ethanol, E-T-H-A-N-O-L. The reason eth prefix represents two carbons, and that's what we're seeing in the alcohol functional group. So the yeast and the sugar are coming together. The yeast is basically being a glutton, and it's eating as much sugar as it can. And that sugar is getting broken down into alcohol. And the alcohol is getting spit out of the other end. And that's what we need to basically separate out. So when we talk about the liquid mash, what we're talking about is is this yeast and sugar and CO2 and ethanol in the flask. Now, here's the key. Why does the yeast stop? Well, little do they know, poor little things. They're leading to their own demise. Meaning that as they produce alcohol, they're really happy in the beginning. Yum, 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 yum. They're eating all that sugar. Yay. And then after they produce the alcohol, the problem is that the alcohol, once it goes to a very high percentage, begins to kill the yeast. Right? 
Same kind of thing happens with hand sanitizers. They, you buy a hand sanitizer that's mainly made up of alcohol. That alcohol's killing bacteria and everything else that it can get a hold of. That's the way it works. Poor little yeast creatures, their urination is basically going to end up killing them in the very end. So when the bubbles stop, that's what's happened. The yeast have died. Why have the yeast died? Because they're now swimming in a vat of their own urine called ethanol, and it has killed them out, and no longer are they active. So this yeast, sugar, and ethanol soup is what goes in to the boiling flask down here at the very bottom. During the step, you're probably going to have to filter. And I'm going to say filter because there's some solid crud that will be in there that you do not want to escape through into your container down there below. We need to clean it out a little bit. We need to clean it up. Get rid of some of that sludge. Get rid of some of that slurry. And that filter is going to help that process a little bit better. Okay, so that's your distillation setup, and that's basically what's happening in the lab when you begin to make your alcohol. All right, so if I go to the screen and maybe I'll enlarge this picture up so you can see it a little bit, here are just different types of distilleries that you might see in the backwoods of the Appalachian Mountains. So these containers are moonshine containers. Uh, these containers basically were used to transport moonshine back into the day and to collect moonshine in. Nowadays, though, it seems that people are finding these in antique stores, and they're paying a pretty penny for them, $80, $90, $150, $200 $200 apiece, depending on the size and, and how good of a quality they are. And they're putting them into their little farmhouse decors that they have at home. So moonshine jugs no longer are really being used for moonshine. They're sitting up on the shelf made to be pretty a little bit. Uh, you also see a copper coil. There's your kind of condenser that's happening. And then you see your vat that would hold the mash. Uh, and of course your collection vial as well. Down here at the very bottom, the same type of thing. It just shows you the internal workings of the coil that's here. So very often, this basically would be circulated with cold water, and that coil would hold the vapors, and those vapors would condense to a liquid, and that liquid would then escape out of the other end. And then here are some pictures uh, back in the day of actual real moonshineries uh, and uh, moonshiners making that alcohol. So there you go. That's basically what you would find out in the backwoods of the Appalachian Mountains uh, and people making their alcohol to sip and to have a good time, right? Okay, so the problem here is that we said that in order for this thing to work the right way, we have to make sure that there's no contamination, right? We have to make sure no contamination is in place when we make a product or when we sell it to someone to drink. Now, the reason that I say that is because this liquid mash is going to house a whole soup of different chemicals. Alcohol is just one of them, and that's it. So we have to get alcohol, E-T-O-H, that's the shorthanded version of alcohol known as ethanol, E-T-O-H. So we're going to have to get ethanol on its own. We're going to have to separate it out. Well, we said that we heat it, right? And that heating is going to turn this to a vapor, and that vapor is going to come over here and condense down, and we're going to collect it. Yeah, that's fine and dandy. That's great. However, other pieces are part of the puzzle. Methanol, M-E-T-H-A-N-O-L, is M-E-O-H. That's the abbreviation that we use for it. And M-E-O-H has a boiling point, right? Ethanol, E-T-H-A-N-O-L. E-T-O-H, that also has a boiling point. The problem is that it's a higher boiling point than methanol is. And then finally, water, right? Water is also part of the pitcher, a large part of the pitcher. And water, we know, has a boiling point of 100 degrees. Well, water has a higher boiling point than ethanol does. So here's the thing. You need to find the boiling point of ethanol. 
and you need to record that data down. And in your distillation setup, you need to stick a thermometer up here at the very top. And you need to record the thermometer's temperature. Because you should only collect the range that the ethanol's boiling point is in. Does that make sense? So as you heat this up, I'm going to first use methanol. Methanol is going to be green. My methanol vapor will escape. Right? And as I begin to heat, all the other vapors will continue to happen too. Well, methanol has a lower boiling point, so it's going to break through first. And it's going to come over here. It's going to condense. And down into the receiving flask, it goes. I don't want that contamination. That has a lower boiling point. I don't need it. That's not what I'm trying to collect. So, I get rid of the receiving flask. Put a new one on instead. When that new one hits... This is going to be my ethanol. I'm going to do that in blue. My ethanol will eventually escape through. And if I collect it at the right temperature range, then only ethanol would be coming over and into the receiving flask over here to the right-hand side. I continue to heat. The pot gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And there's going to be a point where this temperature read will go above the boiling point of ethanol. And when that happens, you're not collecting ethanol anymore. You're collecting other stuff with it. So water begins to evaporate. And water begins to raise this temperature up. And then water begins to come over and into your receiving flask over here to the other side. When that begins to happen, your alcohol sample is much weaker. Nobody wants weak alcohol, right? So the object here is try to get to 100% alcohol, but you're never going to be able to do that. The reason, it's not because of your technique, it's just because of how the alcohol and the water situate themselves. There's no full way to separate water from alcohol. When you get the alcohol in this lab, just like in any other lab, you're going to get a mixture of alcohol and water. You might be able to get 95% but you probably won't be able to get higher than 95% alcohol. Water's always going to be present in a very trace amount. Okay? So the object for you is to try to get as high of a percentage as you can. And we're going to do this by density. Okay? So there's the distillation setup. That's the thought process behind the lab technique that you're going to be doing. You're going to heat it up, collect anything that comes off too early, Dump it down the drain. You don't want any of that stuff. And then when that thermometer reads the alcohol's boiling point, you're going to collect all of those drops into a container. After the boiling point goes up past ethanol, you switch the container back out. If anything else drips over, catch it. But it's probably going to be a mixture of alcohol and other stuff that you don't want. So that is an impure product, okay? So in the next video, we'll continue on and we'll talk about all of the uh, maybe calculations that you need to do for the lab. Uh, here is another picture of a distillation setup, maybe something a little more similar to what you would be setting up in the lab. Again, here's an old picture of a laboratory distillation and then an old picture of a moonshine distillation. So round bottom flask with a little bit of heat down below. There's your fractionating column or your extension if you decide to use it. Thermometer is going to be up here at the top. That vapor will condense down into the condenser and you will collect that sample over here to the right hand side. So there's your distillation setup. Okay. So with that said, come back for a third video for this pre-lab quiz and I think that we'll finish it up at that time.